We are ready here whenever you are. Thank you, Tamara. Steve, are you on? I am on. Okay, and Steve, I'm sorry. I didn't take those bills out of the PowerPoint. <laughs> You're going to have to hit your space bar a number of times when you get to them. Those little graphics. Sorry about that. Okay, so reconvening. Um, just a reminder to everybody, there is a Google Doc, um, and it's available for you to drop your questions in. Again, you know, we'll use that to form the basis of our session, but if there's things you want to drop in the Google Doc right now, as we're going through the presentation, I'm trying to respond and, you know, um, as I can, so feel free to drop some comments in there. Um, and now we're going to pick up with, uh, we had a good overview of curriculum management, and now Steve is going to spend an hour talking about uh, enrollment, which sounds like a lot, except for when you consider uh, the size and scope of enrollment and the fact that we've been working on it for some years. So, Steve? It's all you. So oh, what we hope to accomplish in this small segment, because as Carol mentioned, uh, um, there's a lot in enrollment, is to provide a very high level understanding of the functional areas of the quality student module. In some areas we're going to dip a little lower in, but we're going to try and stay at a very, very high level. Uh, we also want to uh, springboard off of the work that Dan had just done to give you an understanding of how quality student enrollment builds off of quality student curriculum management. And we also want to lay... Are you sharing? Are you sharing? I am. Uh, we don't... No, I, we're not seeing your, um, your screen. Is anybody else seeing Dan's presentation? No screen here. No. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Okay. Give it another were you, not see, were you not seeing anything at all? I'm not seeing anything. I'm just seeing Adobe share my screen. No, you're fine. Just over you. Stop. There you go, Steve. <laughs> I think I started on. <laughs> it's Jason. Jason and Carol. <laughs> we met, but I just... <laughs> okay, we're great now. Thank you. Okay. So you may want to back up to the uh, objectives. Yeah, great. Thank Here we you. go. Okay. All right. So once again, just to provide a high-level understanding of the functional areas in quality student enrollment, to show some of the connections between quality student enrollment and quality student curriculum management, and really to lay the groundwork for the following sessions and the training where we can go more in depth and do deeper dives. You've seen this diagram before from Carol, showing the institutional facing and student facing aspects. Okay. So in that, in that first um, module is setup. And for, there's a lot of setup that goes along in the system, but for this uh, purpose, we're talking about setting up times. Um, so we're going to start with, we're going to establish calendars. Um, usually we'll establish the, um, the, the year calendar first, indicating which days are holidays, which days are instructional days. Then from that we will build academic years, and the system is able to accommodate more than one academic year at an institution. You may have an academic year for your undergraduate school that is different than the academic year for your school of medicine or your law school or any other body. So the system will accommodate setting up multiple academic years that can be in effect in overlapping periods. You then establish terms and subterms. So within your academic year, you may set up uh, quarters or semesters, fall, winter, spring, summer. Um, you can then create subterms underneath those um, that may be a four-week um, term at the beginning of fall and you have a second one the next four weeks, et cetera. The idea is for the system to allow you to inherit information from each higher level entity. So does you establish a holiday or um, 
non-instructional days in the actual uh, year calendar, when you establish your academic years, that information is inherited by the academic year and then may or may not be altered at that level based on the institution's desire to constrain that information. Likewise, the terms will bring things down from the academic years and the subterms will be from the terms. Within those terms is where you define most of your milestones. So you will define the beginning and ending period for registration. You will define the beginning and ending period for when students may add classes. You may define the beginning and ending periods for when students can drop classes, both drops without academic record and drops with academic record, such as a mark of W. You can establish multiple grading submission periods, including midterm grades and uh, final grade submissions. You can establish the final examination schedule, and you can do census dates. And these are just some of the milestones that are going to be available in the um, term administration. But once you've done that, you're going to set up your environment. And primarily, we're talking about course registration environment. You'll set up um, various global registration rules which will include things like, but not be limited to, maximum and minimum units or credits per term so that you can restrict by student group. Um, it may be global. It may be for all undergraduate students. Um, the total number of credits that they can register for without receiving special permission or exemptions, which we'll talk about later. Whether or not mandatory advisement is in effect for that particular period of time. You then establish your registration appointment times for the term. And we're, we're doing a serious look in the project about these registration appointment times. Uh, there are two reasons that schools currently set up appointment times for their students to register. One of those reasons is system resource related, whether or not your current systems can actually handle the volume of students attempting to register. And we tend to spread that out over time. There's also a potential pedagogical reason for um, setting appointment times so that you may want to do things like allowing students who are closer to obtaining their degree to register early so that they can get the classes that are necessary. Um, you may set up certain uh, special times for uh, special populations like athletes or students with disabilities. So all of that will happen in, in this particular um, module area. Um, so all that's uh, with the registration environment. Then we're also going to have a setup um, which will be very involved in really forward link, uh, looking for the project on hold and exemption types. And we'll get into um, more of a definition on what holds and exemptions are later uh, towards the end of the presentation. But holds there are fairly um, well understood, although we have a very specific definition. And exemption types are basically a way of making an exception or exempting a student from a rule that the system would otherwise enforce on them. Next up is establishing people and permissions. Now that we've moved, we're moving into the actual enrollment area of the system, our relationships with the people are becoming a little more complicated. And we, we have to think of them in terms of two different functions or categories. We have people as actors. And actors are people who can use the system and uh, perform functions on the system. Um, we associate these people with organizations through the Kuali Identity Management um, module of RICE. We define role-based authorizations for them. We have the ability or will have the ability to delegate authorization so that if someone is temporarily unavailable on vacation out of the country on sabbatical, they can delegate their authorizations to someone else who can act in their behalf. We know we have to interface with HR systems. We're going to have to pull across not only staff members, advisors, <laughs> Um, but instructors of all sorts through, from our HR system. We also may have to interface with other external systems, such as identity management systems that handle non-employees that may need to have similar authorizations in quality student. And finally, we're going to have to deal with third-party access and permissions. 
the primary um, example of that is like to give access to their information to their parents or, or other parties. Secondly, we have to think of people as objects. Uh, now that we're in enrollment, students are also, in addition to being actors, they are objects. We do things to them. We do things for them. Um, likewise, faculty who are in instructor roles are also objects as they are getting entered into the system um, as instructors of record for particular course offerings. Once again, we're going to have to interface with internal and external systems to handle this. We're also uh, working quite closely to make sure that we are aligned with the PESC standards for people records. And PESC, for those who don't know, stands for the Post-Secondary Education Standards Committee. And they taking the lead, really, on establishing standards for the electronic transmission of information so that things like electronic transcripts can, can come alive. Now we're Activities. And Dan went over that, particularly on his last slide. Course offerings is actually taking that canonical course and creating a specific instance of the course within a valid term. And by a valid term, I mean a term that the canonical course um, is legitimate for. As courses change, they will have different terms that they become effective with. So the course offering must be within a term that's effective for the canonical course. The scheduling of these courses takes place at the activity level. So the individual lectures, labs, discussions, et cetera, are scheduled by the department schedulers or by central offices. We're going to have the ability to occur through either a rollover or a one-off process. In the beginning, the rollover may be very, very basic, and it'll take all or most of your courses from one year and move them into the like term in, the next, in another year. Um, we may get more sophisticated in later phases of the enrollment deliverables to allow subsets of departmental control and sandboxing with that. Likewise, the, at the course offering is where instructors are assigned. And once again, that is done at the activity level. Room and time assignments are going to be done um, on quality student, but the actual, I'm sorry, time, date and times are usually going to be done on quality student, depending on how, how your institution schedules. And then we plan to interface with institutional scheduling systems provided by third parties in our first um, enrollment releases. So R25, Resource 25, is probably the most commonly used amongst the quality student partners. Other institutions use Ad Astra, and there are other uh, products out there. Uh, a later development in quality student had planned to do actual room assignment, but at this phase, we're going to be doing the interfaces with the existing system. In addition, when creating course offerings, the departments will be able to add additional registration eligibility restrictions beyond what the canonical definition is. As, as Dan mentioned, different institutions have different degrees of fidelity to what is in the canonical record versus what they actually offer in each term. So we're going to give the institutions the ability to usually augment, um, but uh, some institutions may want to subtract um, eligibility restrictions. An example of this would be if an eligibility restriction for an upper division uh, math class may require senior standing, they may, offer, they may have a particular offering of that class that they only want for engineering majors. So although at the canonical level, curricular speaking, it just needs to be a senior, they can offer a class on Monday afternoon just for engineering majors, and they would put those restriction, eligibility restrictions in here. 
In addition, the departments will have the ability to establish seat pool definitions, which further restrict registration by population. And that, those are done at the um, offering level, and they may be exclusive or may not be exclusive. For example, if you have 50 seats in a particular course available, you may establish 30 seats for juniors and 20 seats for seniors if you're doing um, if the aggregate is restricted, or if you want to overlap, you could do 30 juniors and 30 seniors, and what you would wind up with is no more than 50 people in the class, of which no more than 30 can be either juniors or seniors. May I just jump in real quick? Yes. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, hi. I just, um I just want to make the point that when we talk about enrollment here, and as you're defining it and going through this, which is great, we're really looking at what we're conceptualizing for all of enrollment, not necessarily what will be available in E1 versus later on. Those are still scoping decisions that we're, that we're working through, right? We just want to set the expectation while we realize this is everything that enrollment system needs to accommodate, whether it's in the first release or not. It's, as part of the work that will happen in parallel delivery. Just want to make that point. <laughs> All right, Just no problem. Setting expectations. Okay. Um, likewise, at the course offering, we will define a very. We're planning on a very sophisticated wait list um, ability that will be delivered in various um, complexities at different levels uh, or release levels of enrollment, as Carol just mentioned. Um, wait lists will be able to be handled either at the course level or the section or activity level. In addition, uh, in the course offerings, uh, the departments will be able to refine course or activity specific fees. So some of this is done at the curricular level in the canonical course, but once again, at the offering level, institutions will be able to add additional fees or remove fees as appropriate. Now we move into course registration. Um, I love the shopping cart, by the way. <laughs> so um, one of the initial things that happens in course registration is the, the checking of registration eligibility for the student. And there are term-specific requirements. There are annual and term-based acknowledgments. What those may be is you may be required to give a, an immunization warning to students, reminding them that they have to be um, show proof of immunization for various communicable diseases to your health center. They must acknowledge seeing that, and at that point, we may release them to move forward in the registration process. We'll check to make sure if there are appointment times that they are doing their activity within the appointment period, and we'll also check for holds. One of our forward-looking um, visionary items is implementing a schedule builder, which will not be part of E1. And the schedule builder is used to help the students plan um, their schedule for the semester and taking into account the program that they're in, any general education requirements that they may have, and any interests that they've previously identified. It will be integrated with the learning plan, which will handle much of that information, as well as with the degree audit system to give feedback to the learning plan. Likewise, it will interact with the schedule of classes for the term so that it will not try and advise the student to take a class that is not being offered. The actual registration activity is going to be done through a registration cart concept. And the card is a group of drop and add transactions that are going to, the student would like to submit as, here's, here's the change I'd like to make in my schedule. I want to add these classes. I want to drop these classes. It's very much um, like Amazon and other web-based um, systems use. Course registration, once a student attempts to register for an individual course or registration offering, we'll, we'll check specific registration eligibility. Class and year levels, junior, senior, one, two, three, um, majors, minors, any requisites, pre, co, or anti, and there's a variety of other things that can be checked as well. And those eligibility validations are done against the offering, not against the canonical. This is the point at which students will be offered the opportunity to join a wait list if one exists for a class that is filled. They're also 
um, validations being done for special populations. Student athletes have certain requirements as to how many units they must require if they're an NCAA Division I um, team. International students have certain requirements from, uh, from immigration and customs enforcement to maintain their appropriate standing while they're in this country. And likewise, veterans, the um, requirements for those continue to evolve and get more complicated. The other thing we're doing we really want to call out specially is that the founding institutions were very clear that it was necessary from their standpoints to include tuition and fee calculation as part of the registration process. We want to be able to tell students the financial impact on their registration decisions. And we envision this um, evolving over the different module releases. Initially, we will probably just be showing this is the total result of what it is you're doing. The next phase will be with student accounts receivable system, um, letting them know what the incremental effect of what they're doing may be. And then finally, once the financial aid module is available, it will interact with all of those to give the student a real idea of what's going to happen with their finances, whether they're going to receive scholarships, whether they've dropped below the minimum requirements, et cetera. So once we've got the students in the courses registered appropriately, we now need to assess their performance in the courses. So obviously the most um, fundamental things are midterm and final grade submission processes, which will allow faculty members to go on to uh, the quality student and record grades and submit them to the central office. It will also accommodate a change of grade process so that once those grades are in quotes posted to the student's record that if changes need to be made it will be handled not through paper ultimately but through a, an online process. It handles the GPA calculation rules. Um, all of our institutions have a variety of GPAs that we calculate. We calculate term GPAs, we, calcula we calculate cumulative GPAs, we calculate program GPAs, we may calculate major GPAs, we will calculate undergraduate different than graduate. So all of those rules have, are at the institution's control and come up in course assessment. We'll also be able to do grade distribution reporting so that departments and schools and other administrators can see um, mean, median, mode, and any other relevant information by course or be able to roll that up. Um, by either offering course, perhaps in departments and schools, to get that information. This just gives you a nice pause. Yeah. <laughs> pause and tab through all that. Sorry. That's okay. I can take a sip of water. <laughs> Now we move into uh, the ring with uh, related to program, program enrollment, program assessment, and program offering, not in that order. So um, we, had a, we had a discussion um, with Dan about this as well. We talked about canonical programs, that they're approved at the curriculum level. They're never directly associated to students. That was, that's the distinction between an offering and the canonical program. So the canonical program never has a relationship to any individual student. And they exist for all types of programs. You saw that we, can, that we treat a credential like a, bachelor, a baccalaureate degree as a program. We treat a major as a program. We treat a minor as a program. So any student will have a combination of programs at different points of time in their association with the university. So a program offering is the specific instance of a canonical program for a term period. So that will have, it will always have a beginning term. It may not have an ending term if it's ongoing. It may have an ending term if it's for a distinct period of time. You may offer multiple program offerings for each canonical program that can be effective at the same time. An example of that, and I'll go back to Carol's favorite, um, at USC, the MBA program is one canonical program. 
we have an executive MBA. We have a part-time evening MBA. We have a full-time daytime MBA program. Each one of those would have its own offering established of that canonical program, and then students would be associated to that particular offering. Most undergraduate programs will be ongoing. Your typical, is, as Dan mentioned with the sociology major, a typical Bachelor of Arts in sociology, um, it just starts and keeps going. There, there isn't enough of a distinction from term to term or year to year in order to make a separate offering. Um, Lockstep programs, which um, he gave an example of their executive MBA, which starts, has 16 months, and then ends. Those may have a program offering for each cohort, and that's a good example of those. Basically, when you talk about programs, you can talk about four um, overall categories of them. Open, unrestricted programs are programs which have, we'll say, not no admission criteria, no selection or entrance criteria, but very little. You must be admitted to the university, maybe all that's there. And there are no capacity limitations to it, so you're not going to limit the number of students that you're going to associate with that particular program. First come, first serve programs likewise have very little entrance criteria. But they do have capacity limitations, and you're going to process the requests in order as they come in until those capacities are met. Restrictive programs are those programs that have entrance or admissions criteria, but they don't have capacity limitations. And finally, selective or competitive programs are those programs that have both strong entrance or admission criteria and capacity limitations. An example at USC would be the cinema um, programs are all selective, competitive, because they both have very, they have both restrictive criteria and they have very limited capacity that they will admit each year. So within program enrollment, given those, those four categories, you will have some form of application process. The uh, process will conduct the eligibility review. So to let the student know up front whether or not they meet the requirements to get into that program, whatever they may be, however detailed they are or however loose they may be. The student will complete the application. They'll attach any required documents. They may require writing samples, um, co musical compositions, anything that may be necessary to complete that application, and then it'll route through any approval process that may exist. And in this way, it'll behave very much like curriculum management in that it uses the quality enterprise uh, workflow um, capacity to send the particular program request to whichever people are necessary to make the decisions about whether the student can get in. It may be that the program just checks their eligibility and they're in if it's a non-restrictive, completely open um, program, or it may bounce it around to different people. And then, of course, notifying the applicant. Likewise, with program enrollment, once you've gotten them in, you need to be able to get them out. Um, and sometimes they'll get out for, for good reasons, like they've graduated and met all their requirements. Sometimes they will take steps to withdraw from their program, sometime, which is program withdrawal. Sometimes they will just stop registering, and we've settled on the term stop outs for that group of people. And then there are people that the institution is going to terminate their association with the program for some academic reason, and that would be a disqualification. So now we've gotten them into programs. Now we need to assess their progress in the program. So um, there are several satisfactory progress requirements that get checked. Learning results calculated and consumed are, include term GPAs, cumulative GPAs, units and credits completed, terms years completed, milestone achievements. So once again, you may have major GPAs, minor GPAs that you'll be checking. 
your milestone achievements are the student must have done something by a certain period of time, and that period of time can be relative to when they started the program or relative to credit hours that they've earned. So all of that um, will be accommodated ultimately in the satisfactory progress of results. Potential actions that come out of these uh, satisfactory progress analyses are probation, which means we're allowing you to continue, but you are in some academic trouble. And if you don't uh, achieve certain defined goals, we will have to dismiss you from the university or from the program. Um, dismissal is the next one, which is you, you've had a chance and you haven't come up to snuff. So you are dismissed and will terminate your um, association with that program. Or you're continuing on because you're meeting all the continuance requirements. These are applied at various levels at the institution. It may be institutional-wide, like a cumulative grad, undergraduate GPA may be required. It may be specific um, number of units or GPAs in, the, in courses taught in the college in which your program is offered. Or it may be program-specific um, requirements. Those were continuance requirements we were discussing. Now we move to completion requirements. So completion requirements are usually what you think of in terms of degree audit. And the Quality Student System project has adopted a two-phase strategy in dealing with this. We did significant due diligence with the You Achieve product, which also is known as DARS which is in use by several of our institutions already, and determined that we would be able to integrate to a third-party solution and that that's the approach we'd like to take. But the complexities related to degree audit systems are even bigger than we had thought to begin with. So the long-term, and stressing long and long-term, is to build the KS module to do this internally to our systems. So short term, we're going to pursue integration um, efforts. And the first one that is being chosen is the You Achieve product by Red Lantern. Next is the assessment of graduation clearance requirements. This is, this is uh, different from completion requirements. And the completion requirements typically is looking at you're taking the courses in the groups that you're supposed to and achieving the grades. But graduation clearance is the whole process of saying that this person is eligible to graduate, are they going to graduate, um, and actually granting the degree. So there will be um, support for identifying candidates, and different schools do it in different ways. At USC, we use the DARS You Achieve product to tell us who is eligible to graduate each term, and then we proactively reach out to them. Other schools require students to apply within a certain period of time to indicate their belief that they will be um, graduating at the end of a particular term. And the system will be able to accommodate whichever institutional preference um, is there. Make sure they uh, clear any required steps, which may be getting sign-offs um, from various offices that you've returned materials, um, that you don't have an outstanding uh, financial bill to the institution, et cetera. Then the posting of the degrees and notifying the candidates of the results. OK, so we'll move back. So we're now moving into the middle of the two circles, or the three circles, on academic planning. So academic planning is primarily student-facing, but a lot of it involves um, the departmental advisors as well. And what we plan to support long-term is the development of sample learning plans for specific programs, so that each program may have one or more learning plan samples associated with it that students can then pick up and used to as a uh, foundation to start their own individualized learning plan. Coordination of the learning plan between the student and their academic advisor. 
making sure that the advisor has input on what it is the student is planning to do to make sure that the student's goals and their, um, their academic plan are in sync, and integration of the learning plan with the term schedule of classes, as I mentioned before, the registration schedule builder that we discussed briefly before, the academic record to determine grades for things they've already taken, and the degree audit system to uh, make sure that their program requirements are being met. It would be awful to have them um, develop a learning plan that will not get them to their program completion. So as a parallel effort going on, because learning plan was uh, de-scoped from the early iterations of enrollment, the University of Washington has a My Plan project, which is occurring there, that has been funded by the student technology fee to improve student academic planning and advisement. So each semester or quarter, um, the UW students pay a technology fee to the university, and they're, for the first time, I think ever, an administrative use of that technology fee has been approved to get project funding, and that is to develop the My Plan. And we can think of that as learning plan light. It will not have all the functionality um, that we intend for quality student, but it will allow students to identify and select courses to meet their program goals. It will integrate with the UW's existing systems with their schedule of classes and their degree audit system. It's going to be based on the tech KS technology stack as much as is possible. And it will be contributed back to the KS project by the University of Washington and will form ultimately the um, basic elements of our learning plan. So we're now moving in to some of the cross-cutting um, concepts that we're going to be using in the project. So the first one, and Carol mentioned it briefly before, is the academic record. Um, and it's, it's not a process on its own, and in many ways it's not a thing in and of itself. But it's a virtual collection of things related to a student's learning experience at an institution. And the simple way of thinking about it is it is, at a minimum, the data needed to produce a transcript. But it can include, and in many cases will include, much more. It will include information regarding the student's program history, graded courses by term, grades received, units and credit totals, GPA calculations. It's also PESC aligned, once again, with those standards, particularly to help in facilitating electronic transcript exchanges. It includes degrees awarded, transfer coursework and its evaluation, and term and graduation-based honors. That would include things like, at the term level, dean's list. Graduation would include um, cum laude, summa, and magna, orders of the coif, or any other specific degree notated honors. We mentioned before holds, and we think we understand what holds are, but we may be surprised. Um, and this is one of the cross-cutting concepts as holds will be able to influence activities throughout the quality student system. We most often think of them in terms of pure registration holds, but they will be able to affect the ability to get transcripts, um, the ability to get refund checks once the student finance modules are there, a variety of things. So holds are actually associated to a student. They're a thing that is associated to a student. They are for a given time period, so they become effective and they expire, and that may be a date range or it may be term specific, depending on how it needs to be expressed to the system. Usually they will originate from another system, like a housing system, a health services system, parking, et cetera. Before student finance is there, they would probably be generating holds as well. Um, likewise, financial aid, admissions can do the same thing until we get them. Uh, those modules released. <clears throat> As I said before, they may uh, prevent a variety of activities, some of them are listed there. And the hold itself must be removed or overridden. 
by removing, you declare it's no longer valid, so it re it, the record of it re is uh, retained in the system, but it's no longer effective for the student. Or it may be overridden. And what an override is, is an override is a um, single instance um, decision not to enforce a hold. Um, it, does, it has no time duration. It only has an instant. So you may override the hold for the student to register, and they go in and register, and they, attend, and they still have the hold, and they attempt to do more registration activity. And since it was overridden rather than removed, they would have to go and get another override. The previous one has been used up, as it were. Blocks. So where blocks come in are blocks are different than holds and that block is not a thing associated with a student. It is a real-time evaluation of student attributes which determine limitations on actions. Some of the obvious ones are requisite checking, course registration restrictions where they have to be juniors, seniors, etc. cetera. Um, so it's the system going out and at the point that some action is being attempted for the student, whether the student is doing it or an administrator is performing the action, it will evaluate the student attributes and determine whether or not that action is allowed. The block changes if the student's attributes change. So if it is their class level standing, junior, senior, third year, fourth year, and um, a late grade is posted, and the student has now received more units, so their standing has changed, immediately the block would recognize it and not need some manual intervention. The final thing with blocks is they may be exempted. And we'll, our next section is on exemptions, so that'll, I'll give you a little more detail on that. Exemptions. Exemptions are a persistent time-based grant of and I'm going to use the word exception here because otherwise I'm using exemption to define exemption to a given policy, which usually invalidates some form of block. An example, <laughs> a, stu a student trying to take a, a course that is restricted to juniors. They're not a junior, they're a sophomore. They can get an exemption granted to them that allows them to take that course regardless of that block so that when they attempt to register, the system will recognize the exemption and invalidate the block and just move beyond it. Exemptions may be initiated I, by I will, uh, Steve, that's perfect. I love that you don't want to use the term in the definition. Just a little FYI to, to, to the group. Um, the word exception is a protective class in Java, and so we don't actually, even though I think functionally most people talk about grading students exceptions rather than exemptions, we had to find a different word on the functional side. Otherwise, it was going to be crazy making later on. So just a little bit of background there. Continue, Steve. Thank you. So it can be initiated by students, instructors, or advisors. Um, there will be a request process with workflow dependent on specific types of exemptions requested. And as you remember in the setup phase, we talked about setting up holds and exemptions. So part of that setup um, will be for exemptions regarding um, class level restrictions for the math department. Here's who this goes to um, in order to get clearance for it. So that type of thing will be established in the setup. So once again, we've given some examples, prerequisites, program level restrictions, year and class level restrictions, but also degree audit requirements. So you will be able to process exemptions um, for degree requirements that will get passed over to the degree audit system and consumed by them so that the student's um, degree audit will be actually correct. And I think I finished early. 16 minutes early. I was planning for 45, hopefully, so. <laughs> Perfect. Boy, you nailed it. Um, so just a few words uh, before I pass over uh, the presentation over to Kathy, who's going to talk to us about services. Um, thank you, Steve. That was, that was a, a very good introduction to these different functional areas and the type of functionality that we as SMEs and business analysts would like to see in the product. And I think that's probably an important thing to, to consider is 
What we wanted to do was present you with an overview of all the types of business requirements, all the types of use cases that we've considered in our requirements analysis um, so that hopefully you can see your own needs represented in the material that we've collected thus far. That is not to say, and I love Steve's positive attitude saying, you will be able to do this and you will be able to do that. We haven't actually built it yet. So, um, as you all so part of what's going to happen over the next couple of years is looking to see exactly which of these requirements and which of these features we will actually be able to deliver in parallel delivery, what release they'll be in, et cetera. And of course, you will all be part of that process of figuring that out. So, um, so I just wanted to make that clear that these are, these are basically representative of the materials that we've collected to date, but we'll be looking to this entire group for understanding them further, prioritizing, figure out what we need to deliver when and how. So I was ready to install it today listening to you, Steve. <laughs> it was great. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Kathy, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about um, how a lot of these features that we're envisioning might actually get supported through services, even if they're not ultimately built out in the final product. Kathy? 